So Lisa Feldman Barrett, I don't, I'm not sure if you've done work together, but at least you're- I, I found out about her because of you oh, and your podcast sure. with her. And then I brought her onto Instagram to do an Instagram live about emotion. Yeah. And it was fascinating. And she's a very spirited and very, very smart woman. And- uh, Fearless yeah. and uh, brilliant. So uh, I love her. She's amazing. Uh, she kind of, she, she's not a scholar of hallucinogens, hallucinogens or dreams, but she had this intuition that there may be a connection between the kind of dissociation that happens in dreaming and that that happens in um, like psychedelics. I, because of my previous conversation with you uh, on, on this podcast, uh, Matthew Johnson from Johns Hopkins reached out and you said, but uh, he, he commented, I think, on something that we commented on, I don't even remember exactly what, but that there's not many studies. It's not being uh, psychedelics and not being rigorously studied in an academic setting, like with the full rigor of science. And he said, well, actually uh, that's exactly what we're doing and they're extremely well-funded now. And it has been a long battle to get it accepted as a serious uh, scientific pursuit. So, um, but, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about that, but sure. do, do, do you have a sense about connection between dreams and psychedelics or these uh, different explorations of mind states that are outside of the standard normal one that's mm -hmm. the wake mindset? Yeah, I loved your discussion with Matthew. I knew of the Hopkins group and the stuff they were doing, but I didn't know much about it at all. And I learned a ton from that podcast. I reached out to him just to say, Love what you're doing. I think it's incredible. So yeah, your podcast has been a great source of uh, serious academic and intellectual um, conversation for me. Um, I think what they're doing at Hopkins is amazing. Um, he has a collaborator there, actually that had a very popular paper I just throw out there for fun, um, who was a postdoc at Stanford. Her name is Ghoul. Um, she's Turkish, I believe. Um, and her, and I, I've, apologize, her last name escapes me at the moment, but that's just a function of my brain. Um, she had a paper showing that uh, she put octopi on MDMA on ecstasy <laughs> and found out, this was published in in a in Current Biology, showing, it was a great journal, showing that the octopi then wanted to spend more time with other octopi and they started <laughs> cuddling. Yeah. So uh, their colleagues out there. But um, the, Hop <laughs> the Hopkins project is super interesting because I think they were initially supported mainly through private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting to see some more interest at the level of NIH about psychedelics. It's a complicated space because the psych psychedelics are always looked at through the lens of the 60s and people losing their mind. And there's a, you know, in, I always say, you know, you don't want a Ken Kesey out of the game. You know, Ken Kesey was amazing, right? Part of the whole beat generation thing. And he was actually at the VA near Stanford. That's where he eventually, in Menlo Park, he wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, or maybe that was about him. Anyway, the comments will tell me how wrong I am. <laughs> but it's, I think I'm tossing these words in the general, in the right general direction. But, you know, Huxley, Kesey, they did a lot of LSD yeah. and they lo all lost their jobs. Right, they lost their jobs at big institutions like Harvard and Stanford and elsewhere, or they left um, because they they made themselves the experiments. Yes, Hopkins, as far as I know, is one of the first places, if not the first place, where whatever Matt may or may not be doing in his own life, I don't know. It's really about the patients and whether or not the patients in these um, mm -hmm. institutional review board approved studies, whether or not they're getting better in situations like depression. I think. It's clear that there's a very close relationship between hallucinogenic states and dreaming of the sort that would describe for REM dreaming. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a terrific set of books and body of scientific literature from a guy named Alan Hobson, who was an MD, is at Harvard Med, and he wrote books like Dream Drug Store. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first neuroscience books I ever read was about hallucinations and how psychedelics and dreaming are very similar. That was way back when I was in high school, I was just curious. And he really understood the relationship between LSD and REM dreams and how similar they are. I think psychedelics, and Matt knows way more about this than I do, of course, but psychedelics have some very interesting properties. They are certainly not for everybody, right? And kids, it's a problem, you know. The, I think the major issues right now around the psychedelic conversation is that it's clear that they can unveil certain elements of neuroplasticity. They make the brain amenable to change. 
changing up space-time relationships, changing up the emotional load of an event and being able to reframe that. It's clear that happens. But there's two major issues. One is that people talk about plasticity as if plasticity is the goal, but plasticity is a state within which you can direct neurology. And the question is, what changes are you trying to get to? So people are just taking psychedelics to unveil plasticity mm -hmm. without thinking about what circuits they wanna modify and how, I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think there's great potential, however, for people opening up these states of plasticity with psychedelics or otherwise, and directing pl the plastic changes toward a particular endpoint. And there's an absolutely spectacular paper out of UC Davis, published as a full article in Nature just a couple months ago, showing that there are psychedelics that are now can be modified. So chemists have gotten into the game now and modifying to take away the hallucinogenic component where you still get the neural plasticity components. Wow. And for a lot of people would be like, oh, well, that's no fun. That's yeah. not giving you the, the, the wild experience. But I do think that that holds great potential for people that wouldn't otherwise orient towards some of these drugs. So I think it's really marvelous what's happening and what's about to happen. And I think there there is one drug in that kit of drugs that's very unusual, like psilocybin, LSD, those promote heavy, heavy serotonin release mm -hmm. and lateralized connections ramp up, et cetera. Matt talked about all that. But MDMA, ecstasy, is a very unusual situation where dopamine is very, very high because of the, the way the drug is designed. Dopamine release, it goes through the roof. So people feel great and they wanna move and they have a lot of energy. But serotonin levels are also high and that's a very unnatural state. And why MDMA may, may and I wanna highlight may, have particularly high potential for the treatment of certain forms of depression is an interesting question because never before in, as far as we know, in human history, has there been a possibility of opening up dopaminergic and serotonergic states at the same time, dopamine being the molecule of pursuit and reward and more and more, and serotonin being one of bliss and being content right where you're at. So it's almost like those two things wrap back on themselves and create this very unusual state and I think the bigger conversation is what to do with a state like that. Mm -hmm. Like, do you, is it about self-love? Is it about developing love for another person? Is it about forgetting hate? Like these are powerful molecules. And I think if the academic community and the clinical community is gonna move forward with them in any serious way, I think there needs to be a conversation about what they're being used for. Right, and, and coupled with that, I think similar to what you're saying, uh, like Matt has talked about, as others have talked about, some of the biggest benefits of like progress, whether it's like quitting smoking and all that kind of stuff, is in the is in the days after. It's the integration of the experience. So maybe you open up the brain to the neuroplasticity, but then there's like work to be done. It's not you're like you shake up something in in the, in the biology of the brain, but you have to do then it's work. Absolutely. A friend of mine who's a, a physician, he says, um, who's quite open to this idea that psychedelics could play a, a real role in, in real medicine, says um, better living through chemistry still requires better living. <laughs> and and I think it's a, it's a beautiful statement. I wish I had said it, Be, um, but he gets the credit. But the plasticity window opens. And then as you said, what are you gonna do in the two weeks, three weeks, four weeks afterward? Because that's the real opportunity. But those psychedelic experiences are really a case of an amplified experience inside of an amplified experience, so much so that everything seems relevant. Yeah. And it's um, it's it's fascinating. I mean, I my hope is that the AI and machine learning and the brain machine interface and all that will eventually be merged with the psychedelic treatments right. so that you, an individual can go in, take whatever amount of whatever's safe for them, working with a clinician and really direct the plasticity while maybe stimulating the orbital frontal, medial orbital frontal cortex or increasing the observer or decreasing the observer in the brain or decreasing the amygdala. I mean, it's doable. It's doable with transcranial magnetic stimulation and it's for shutting down activity and it's doable with ultrasound. Ultrasound now allows very focal activation of particular 
brain regions through the skull non-invasively. So it's, it's approaching the same kind of uh, therapy from different angles. One of AI is the computational side, sort of injecting like the robotics, I- I- injecting like, maybe you can even think about it as like electricity, the electrical approach mm-hmm. versus then like the the chemical approach. Absolutely, and then the, psycho- and then the psychology is, yeah. is subjective, right? So it's gonna take some real um, understanding of what that person's, um, lexicon is like, you know, no, that wasn't a pun. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's terrible. I'm, I'm like the worst. <laughs> That's the one thing I know from the feedback on my podcast. My jokes are terrible, but I never claim to be funny. The, <laughs> the, uh, but somebody who they really trust and understands when somebody says, you know, for a very stoic person, like I'm imagining, uh, you interviewed the great Dan Gable. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't know anything about Dan, but can you imagine like you asked Dan, like, you know, how you feel about something while on one of these drugs? And like, <laughs> I mean, his languaging might, if he says that was troubling, it might mean that it was very troubling or not troubling at all. So people are, language is a poor guide because if I say I'm upset, how upset is that? Well, that's very subjective. So you need, we need can you build a tool for that? Can you build an AI tool for that? Yeah, deeper. Yeah, well, maybe that's well, the eye. Maybe that's our. This that's what the eyes could reveal. So language is not just words; it's everything together, and that's one of the fascinating things about the eyes and the window to the soul. I mean, they express so much: the face, the eyes, the body. Um, I mean, Lisa talks about that—the communication of emotions. It's a, it's a super complex.